Hello and welcome to Podiatry Practice Mastery. My name is Don Pelto and I have Tan Pham here with me. Uh, thank you for joining the show. Hey Don, good to see you here and uh, thanks for having me. You're welcome. You're welcome. We were chatting a little bit before, uh, Tan, and you are, uh, you know, lifting you up here. You are efficiency, productivity. You can see from the little uh, mic there, the productivity show. You're a productivity expert and all of us as physicians, we could use help being more productive. Uh, tell me uh, in a few minutes, a little bit about your backstory in terms of productivity, how you got interested in this area. Yeah, I kind of took a, a different path than most people have done. Uh, my parents were both refugees and we immigrated to the Netherlands where I grew up. And then uh, my dream was always to live in the United States. So I ended up moving to the U.S. Uh, after finishing uh, school, but I ended up actually dropping out out of school. And so even though I dropped out, I never stopped learning. Like my formal education stopped, but I was always reading books. I was going to seminars, going to workshops. Um and I was reading about personal development, success, like how to be more productive. And I was learning so much from going through this, but I also know that if I can synthesize all this information, that I can uh, have a better understanding of it. And so I decided to start a blog where I would just share everything that I was learning about productivity, time management, efficiency, goal setting. And uh, I thought, you know what, I'm going to write a blog post every single week. This is for my friends and family. It's a way for me to kind of codify and understand uh, what I'm learning. And that way I can help my friends and family members as well, because they kept asking the same questions about stuff that I was doing. And so I said, you know what, let's do this for about a year and see where it goes. So I wrote a blog post every single week for a year and about six to eight months in uh, major publications like the New York Times and Inc. Magazine and Forbes uh, discovered me and they said, hey, this is great. Like, uh, you guys should all check out this website, AsianEfficiency.com. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> this uh, this kind of took a life of its own. And then from there, uh, I just kept doing experiments. I just kept trying different things on how to be more productive. And then I started taking on clients and see how I could help them based on what I've learned. Uh, so 16,000 clients later, I've kind of developed my own method now where I help people become more productive at work. And wow. Life. Wow. Thank you for for sharing that. And I know and originally when you started, you said you worked with a lot of physicians and I, and I'm, I'm a big advocate of like those, those, those small tips that really move big, those, the levers that kind of move big things in our lives. So in the doctors, can you pick out a, a couple of them that, that you found some of the problems that they had and what are some of the easiest elegant solutions that you found? Yeah. One of the first things I realized when I start working with clients that a lot of people uh, were physicians and there's different types of uh, errors that they needed help with. But one of the ones that stood out most to me was the aspect of note-taking. Now it sounds so simple. Like you meet with the clients and, or patients and you say, Hey, here are the things we've discussed. Here are things that we need to talk about. Here are things that we need to follow up on. And it sounds simple in theory, but when you're so busy and you have to see client after client or patient after patient all the time, it can be overwhelming and information can get easily lost and it's easy to fall, uh, let things fall through the cracks. And so one of the first things we always worked on was creating some sort of note-taking system where they could take notes, store information securely and safely, and be able to access things very quickly as well, and also have follow-ups. And oftentimes you work with an assistant or somebody that helps you. And so we would create like a two-person or three-person system to make sure that everyone had the same information, the same alignment on what needed to be, what needed to be done by who and by when. So it's always like the who, what, when. So that's mm -hmm. like the three questions we always want to be able to answer, the, the three Ws, who, what, when. And then from there, uh, be able to then follow up with people, making sure that the next appointment is scheduled, that the procedures are scheduled as, as needed, and all the resources are rallied. So that was the first thing I noticed. And then the second thing was always a management of time. Because you're just so busy and doing so many different things, uh, it's easy to sometimes to eat your own lunch, right? Or in this case, you like to record your podcast during your lunch times, which I think is a, is a great use of time. <laughs> but also uh, when it comes to just spending too many hours at the office, not having any time for yourself, like you're doing a great service for others, but sometimes people forget to also fill up their own cups so that they can be in a better position to serve others. And so we oftentimes worked on renewal, like recovery, like things people needed to do outside of work so they could feel rejuvenated going back into the office. And so these were the two major things I've noticed. Hmm, that's great, Tan. 
in, in terms of, I know what a lot of us are using now, the uh, electronic medical records, unfortunately, puts a lot of the onus on the doctors now in terms of typing in front of the patients. Um, I found that using a, a, a virtual scribe, basically it's a scribe in your pocket that you kind of do your normal conversation and they do the transcription somewhere else tends to work pretty well. But we still do a lot of our own notes and documentation um, to 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 that. But one of the struggles I always had in my EMR my medical record, when I want to, let's say a patient comes in and they're not going to follow up with me, but I want to check up with them in a couple of months, but I there's no way to put it in my EMR. Do you have any good tips? I'll tell you what I use. I use Todoist. So basically I put two months, you know, yep. I used to use follow up then, but Todoist works a little bit easier and, and it pops it up, but there's no way to, to trigger my staff to do it. Do you have any other good ways of remembering things really quickly on the fly and like two months out to check a patient, see how their orthotics are doing, how they're doing with surgery when you don't really want to make an appointment, any ideas on how to improve that? Yeah, that's one thing I've noticed too, is there's a lot of technology that is either outdated or there's no universal program or standard that people can follow. So oftentimes in the beginning, I would have to help them with custom solutions. Now, software has come a long way since then. So the first thing I always recommend is, yes, if you can scribe it or record it and then have a transcript of it, that's always a great idea. Uh, the other thing is, even if you do it remotely, there, there are services where you can uh, have like a third person or like a, a bot attend oh, your fireflies, meeting. Oh, the fireflies, the fireflies. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah fireflies is an example of those. Uh, but also if you're meeting a client in person or a patient in person, you can have like a, a person there, an assistant to help you with that. And so anytime, uh, this is more a procedural thing, but anytime the, the patient leaves, the first thing you want to do is go over the who, what, when with your assistant. And then that assistant will then put it into another system that mm -hmm. that can be used to follow up. So you could use something like Todoist, you could use something like ClickUp, you could use something like Asana, um, and you just got to make sure that the system will enter the data correctly and the follow up correctly as well, so that they have a system to then follow up with the patients. And so oftentimes, uh, the most important hire you make is that person to help you assist with that, because your specialty is working with the patient itself. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily all the administrative work outside of that, even though that is important, but you are kind of like the quote unquote surgeon in the room. I don't want my surgeon to be handling billing, handling admin work, because that's all sorts of other work that takes away from the focus and energy that they need to do surgery, right? Or in your case, uh, a mm -hmm. different line of work. And so I want my person to what they specialize in to do that one thing that they're trained for and that they went to school for and everything else ideally delegated to somebody else. So you want to hire somebody who's very detail oriented, who is very organized. And these are things you can assess for when you're hiring somebody, but that's the, the main thing I would always tell my clients is make sure you hire the right person for that. And using something like a Colby, a personality test can quickly allow you to see if someone is actually aligned with you or not. Yeah. So I've been a strategic coach for about 10 years. And so we do the Colby there. How did you familiar with Colby? Are you, were you in, involved in any coaching things or? No, I am not. I know uh, strategic, strategic coaching, uh, but um, I think it was Dan Sullivan. Is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. So, so the, Colby, uh, what... the Colby is a good way to work with staff and things. Yeah. Perfect. Wow. Yeah, exactly. So one of my close friends, uh, he's a Colby certified uh, instructor. And so that's how I first found out about it. And he awesome. said, Hey, you should try this out. And uh, now it's a standard procedure in my company to have everyone take a Colby test uh, before they get onboarded. That's great. I'll put the link under, in the show notes, but I'll put the Colby for those that are interested. Um, let's let's talk about, uh, Dan, I, I think a lot of us are, we're good at seeing the patients. We're good at treating the patients. But a lot of times, like we get overwhelmed with everything else in our life that we have to get done that we just really don't have time to do. Do you, do you have any ways to help us with this overwhelm or mistakes when we're trying to be more productive. Um, I'll, I'll give you some examples. Let's say, I don't know, you have to get the car detailed or the car fixed, or like, I find it's the grocery shopping or all these other types of things that need to get done. And you're seeing patients, then you have a family, then you have extracurriculars. And I think there's a, there's a, a weight of overwhelm and almost like a sense of guilt a little bit that we have these other things. And like, when you're with your family, you're worried about something else that you have to do. Any thoughts to that? Oh, absolutely. Like, uh, that's something that I've been very guilty of myself for many years. So the, the best solution, if, uh, if possible, would be to hire an executive assistant to help you with that. Oh. So 
that's tell me something about I, that. I, I, I don't have one. I, so tell me. Yeah, no, I, in my opinion, anybody who has a practice or has a business that makes over six figures in annual revenue, one of the first hires they should make is an executive assistant. And the reason for that is the executive assistant is really either a complimentary person to you or they replicate what you do already and thus free up your time. So for example, in the beginning, you might have to do all the EMRs yourself, but then when you hire somebody that they can then do that, replicate that process so that you don't have to do it, which, which frees up more time for you to do the other things. And so oftentimes nowadays you can find an executive assistant for anywhere between 18 to $25 an hour. And uh, for, to give an example, I have an executive assistant, but she only works roughly 10 hours a week with me. And those 10 hours are probably the best 10 hours I invest every single week because she will get on the phone with banks and credit cards and making restaurant reservations to, uh, you know, I have a bike that needs to be detailed every now and then. Um, she will communicate with my tailor so that she'll come over and pick up clothes and, and, and tailor stuff. So I don't even have to do anything other than give instructions and then she will kind of do everything else. And so that's the first thing I would always recommend is if you can afford one, get an executive wow. assistant. How do you find one? Because I have a virtual assistant that does a lot of the, like the, after the podcast, um, Veronica will upload it to YouTube, upload it to the anchor, do the show notes, yeah. send out the emails. That's a personal, that's a virtual assistant. Is an executive assistant the same or do you have two different people or tell me? Yeah, that can literally be the same person. So to give you an example, my executive assistant lives half the time in Mexico and half the time in the States. So she's kind of like semi-retired in LA and she just does this for fun. And so she she is remote. Uh, we've met a few times uh, and she does everything remote for me. And so uh, now when it comes to personal errands, that's slightly different. I would call that a personal assistant where they have to be in your home and, and such. And I do have one, but that person only comes in for two, three hours a week. Um, and she helps me water my plants and like get groceries every now and then. But nowadays with groceries, you can get those delivered. Uh, no problem. So the other solution is automate or have everything done remotely as much as possible. Um, so for example, you could even have your executive assistant find somebody that could be a quote unquote runner for you to pick up your packages for you as an example. And then they get paid per gig or per hour when you hire them. And there's so many like gig economies out there nowadays. So that if you're in your local city somewhere, find those Facebook groups or particular websites like uh, thumbtack or or TaskRabbit. Or Task Rabbit. And those are the people that you can hire by the hour and they'll come to you. So to give you an example, I have a, a handyman that comes in once a month and I have it scheduled uh, for like two hours. And I don't even know what I need, but I know every time that person comes in, there's always something that needs to be done around the home. Like a mirror might be a little bit crooked or I need to hang up something or something isn't working right now. Uh, and just having the, that person come in for two hours a month uh, automatically doesn't even make me think about what needs to be done. When that person comes, there's always something to be done. And it's just stuff that is so lit, so low on your priority list, but still needs to be done at some point. So any extra help that you can have around you is something I would always encourage. You know, Tim, I'm so in inspired because we're speaking the same language and I, I like it seeing how other people use these. Tell, don't talk to people. Now, where I've struggled in the past is I've, I've tried a certain virtual assistant. They didn't work out. I had one from the Philippines, didn't work out. So it's not as easy as this is my experience. I tried one, didn't quite work out. Try, I'm on the second, didn't work. I'm on the third and it's finally working. Can you tell people it, it might not always work the first time? You have to keep trying and keep working towards things. Is that, is that, was that your experience too, or did you hit it home run the first time? Uh, no, my first two assistants didn't work out either. Um, I started remotely overseas as well, uh, just because you kind of get sold on the dream that you can hire somebody for three, four, or five dollars an hour and it will change your life. And in some ways, they can kind of help you with that. So don't get me wrong. However, um, what I've discovered, and many of my successful entrepreneurs will agree with this, if you have an assistant that's also based in North America, so they're uh, usually trained, they're usually from corporate America, but now want to transition to working from home and have a few extra hours that they want to dedicate to work so that they have more time for their family, that's kind of like the sweet spot of the person that I would recommend that people find. And so oftentimes you can find former project managers or corporate people uh, who want to now work from home or have an extra gig on the side while they're taking care of their families as such. 
Uh, those are the best people I have found. So if you're listening to this or watching this and you go, hey, I want to find an executive assistant, I personally would recommend that you find somebody in, in North America, oftentimes for the same time zone reasons, but also there's a lot of cultural nuances that uh, make a big difference. So to give an example, uh, I'm a big foodie. I love eating food and going out, uh, having great dinners with people. But sometimes getting a reservation is very challenging at certain places. And so my assistant, who used to be a, f a former uh, sales uh, person, she has those skills to be very persuasive and kind of like talk to the hostess or the restaurant owners and say, hey, I have a client that I work with who would love to come to your restaurant and they would publish it all over the place. Like, is there any way that we can get this person in somehow? And there's certain skills and nuances that kind of like re requires that for things like that to happen that uh, makes it totally worthwhile. So that's what I would personally recommend is find somebody in North America. That's that's awesome. That's that's awesome. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, personal productivity in the office, such as a few of the time sucks we have. Getting back to patients, yeah, emails, you know, things like that. That kind of obligations that we have. Any ways to clean those things up? Yeah, I think one of the biggest time sucks for most people uh, is email. We spend way too much time in our email inbox. Even if your work is revolved around email, I think there's a lot of opportunity for winning back time there. So to give an example, I was working with a senior executive at a Fortune 100 company, and she was reporting to 22 different executives uh, through email. And she was spending eight to 10 hours a day in her email inbox. And I go, okay, how do we uh, resolve this? <laughs> how do we get you to be more efficient with email? So long story short, we kind of helped her set up her workflow, but the most important aspect of her workflow was uh, most of the time I recommend that people only check email twice a day, but for her, we bumped it up to three times a day. So one time at nine, one time at one, another time at four, because she was, she was reporting to so many people. And the idea here is that she could turn off her email app or her notifications and still be responsive to all the people that she needed to report to. Because oftentimes we feel this sense of guilt that if we don't respond to an email right away, that we don't seem on top of things or we don't seem responsive. When in fact, if you wait two or three hours to respond to an email, that's totally fine. Like someone else's uh, urgency is not necessarily your emergency. Mm -hmm. So that's always something I always remind people that, hey, it's okay to respond two or three hours later. It's not the end of the world. And if it isn't the end of the world, make sure they call you if it's really that important. So I always like to outline communication protocols for people too, to say, hey, if you send me an email, you can expect a response within 24 hours. But if you need me faster, please give me a phone call or send me a text message. So that way we can prioritize how I how fast I can get back to you. So that's the first thing I would say is check email twice a day if you can, or three times at most, and then limit it to about 30 minutes every time you check email. Uh, so this allowed Lisa, the executive I was working with, go from eight hours a day to her email inbox to less than an hour that's great. a day. So it's being able to focus, right? Uh, the other things that I always look for in an office environment is there's just so many distractions. And so whenever we can eliminate distractions, uh, that's the thing I would always aim for. So to give you an example, if you're working from home or you're working in an office, uh, what are the top three distractions in your environments? For most people, I would say it's the phone. That's one. Uh, number two, it would be other people interrupting. And then three, it could be like a website or an app that you want to check or something that you want to kind of like what we call the just checking stuff. Uh, and how can we add friction to those things so we kind of eliminate the idea that we want to check it out. So for example, if I easily get distracted by my phone, I will put it in a different room. So anytime I'm at my desk, like I don't want to check my phone, I would have to stand up. I would have to walk over. There's a lot of friction added to actually just check what I want to check on my phone. So anytime we have a behavior that we want to change that we don't want to do anymore, I always recommend that people add friction to that as much as possible. So it's very difficult to actually do it. So to give you another example, if I have cookies at home and I love cookies, uh, no matter where I hide them, I will find them because I know where they are and I will eat them at some point, right? But if I don't have them at home, there's just no way I'm going to eat them. And so whenever we can add friction to what we don't want to do, that's something I would always encourage you as well. So especially when it comes to productivity and distractions, think about your top three distractions and how can you add friction to them so you do them less often. 
That's awesome, Tim. You know, as we're finishing up, um, I, I'd like you to tell us a little about, the, I don't know, we may, we may have already been through the three pillars of productivity, but tell us a little bit about that. And if people want to learn more, because if they've listened, like, hey, I, I like this guy, I want to learn more resources, what he has, how they can learn more about you. Yeah, so the three pillars of productivity is a framework that I teach. It's called the T framework and stands for time, energy, and attention. So I believe that anyone who wants to be more productive, they have to maximize their time, they have to maximize their energy, and they have to maximize their attention. So time simply meaning you have the time to do the things you want to do. Energy meaning you have the capacity and energy to do the things you want to do. Because oftentimes we've been in situations where we have the time to do the things we want to do, but we might be too tired. And then guess what? Nothing happens, even though we have the time to do it. And then attention is all about, are we doing the right things? Like nothing pains me more than seeing people spending time and energy on something when it's in fact not something that they actually want to do or is not aligned with where they're trying to go. So those are the three pillars of productivity and something we teach in our workshops and we show you how you can learn how to maximize your time and the skills you need for all these three. And uh, I have a podcast called The Productivity Show. So if people like listening to okay. uh, podcasts, go check it out. And I also have a website, asianefficiency.com, where we have tons of free resources that people can, can go and check out as well. Great. Hey, th this was, I think we gave some great ideas. Uh, those that are listening, uh, please check out uh, The Productivity Show. And Tan, thank you so much for your time. Thank you.